Another crucial area where cancer screening has been felt to have a significant impact has been in the area of gynecologic cancers. So uh, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Georgia McCann, one of our associate professors in gynecologic oncology and a wonderful member of the Mays Cancer Center, uh, helping share a bit with uh, what we know about uh, doing this for this uh, these group of cancers. Thank you, Dr. McCann. Hello, and uh, thank you all for being here and allowing me the opportunity to um, talk to you about um, gynecologic cancers and cancer screening. Um, today, I'm going to focus primarily on cervical cancer, and that's for a couple of reasons. Um, the primary reason is that of, out of all of the gynecologic cancers, cervical cancer is the only one that has a true screening test, um, and that is the pap smear, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, unfortunately, um, ovarian cancers and endometrial cancers don't yet have a screening test available, but at the end, I can talk about some of the signs and symptoms that would be concerning and should prompt further evaluation. The other reason why I'm going to focus on cervical cancer is because cervical cancer um, is, a, is a problem um, and has very high incidence rates in the state of Texas. So um, the state of Texas has one of the highest incidence rates of cervical cancer, and it has one of the highest mortality rates or deaths from cervical cancer. And so there's lots of room for improvement, and this will come in the form of screening. Next slide, please. So first, just an introduction to the female reproductive system. Um, what you can see there on the left side is a picture of our gyne the gynecologic organs, including the uterus, the cervix, the ovaries. Again, we're going to focus primarily on the cervix, which is labeled here um, in the picture. And then to the right of that is what a cervix that is involved by cancer looks like. Um, and so when you're having a pelvic exam, these are the things that your gynecologist is looking for. Um, let's talk about some of the risk factors for cervical cancer. The biggest risk factor is the human papillomavirus, so infection or exposure to the human papilloma or HPV virus. It's important to know that 75 to 80 percent of the world's population that is sexually active has or has been exposed to the human papillomavirus. And so it technically is considered a sexually transmitted disease, but not in the way that um, other infections are considered. So um, this is a virus that's kind of throughout the population, um, and lots of people are exposed throughout their lives. And the good news is that um, for the large majority of women that get exposed, our immune systems will take care of the virus, and we never even know that we have it. Other risk factors for cervical cancer really um, pertain to exposure to the HPV virus. So early onset of sexual activity, multiple sexual partners, a high risk sexual partner, history of prior sexually transmitted diseases, and immune suppression. Next slide, please. So like breast cancer and um, colorectal cancer, you know, cervical cancer is preventable. Um, it is one of the few cancers that we have a vaccine against um, and really good screening strategies where we can prevent almost over 90% of cervical cancers, which is pretty incredible. Um, and the way we do that is with a combination of HPV vaccination and regular pap smear screening. And so what you see below is kind of a, a picture of the natural progression of um, cervical cancer. So over on the left, you start with what normal cervical cells, okay? So um, a woman before, before she becomes sexually active, the recommendation is for HPV vaccination at the age of 11 to 12. And the reason for that early age is one is that the immune response to the vaccine is markedly improved the younger you are. Um, and also, ideally, you would like to have children vaccinated prior to any exposure to the HPV virus so they could benefit from the full protection. Going on, as, patient, as women become sexually active, they will almost inevitably, inevitably be exposed to the human papillomavirus. Um, and that's where our screening opportunities come into play. So we screen um, for the HPV infection and cervical cancer, precancerous lesions between the ages of 21 and 65 years of age. 
And we'll go through that the next slide, kind of what those recommendations are and what it looks like. Um, but it's important to know that if a woman gets exposed to the HPV infection and she either never has a pap smear um, or is kind of lost to follow up over the course of years, sometimes decades, the average is about 10 to 15 years, the HPV virus can cause changes in the cervix that, be, that cause the cells to become precancerous. And again, over the course of years, those changes will eventually lead to a cervical cancer. So it is not uncommon for um, a G1 oncologist like myself to see a patient with cervical cancer who will report an abnormal pap smear 10 to 15 years ago that for, for whatever reason never got followed up. Um, and that's kind of the what we what we the story that we usually hear from patients. And um, it's important to know that most women diagnosed with cervical cancer in the United States, they've either never been screened or have not been screened in the last five years prior to diagnosis. And that just underlines the importance of screening pap smears. Next slide, please. So these are the current recommendations um, for vaccination and screening. Okay, so again, I'm going to emphasize it's very important to use the HPV vaccination. It is a cancer vaccine um, and one of the very few cancer vaccines that we have. Again, the recommendations are to vaccinate both boys and girls between the ages of 11 to 12. Um, Again, like I said earlier, the reason for that age uh, recommendation is because that's when they, if they get vaccinated at that age, that's when they'll have the most protection and the most benefit from the vaccine. If you miss that opportunity, that age range, it, the HPV vaccine is approved for girls ages 13 to 26 and boys 13 to 21. And most recently that has been extended up to the age of 45. So even if you've already become sexually active or even if you've already had one of the types of the HPV virus, you are still eligible to get the vaccine. It's important to note that there are over a thousand different strains of the human papillomavirus and only some of them will cause a cancer. Others will cause non-cancerous lesions like genital warts. And so the vaccine that we have protects against the, the virus types that are most likely to lead to cervical cancer. Once a woman turns 21 years old, um, the recommendation is for a pap smear every three years up to the age of 29. And so let's talk about what, what that means and what a pap smear is. Um, it's important to know that when you go to a gynecologist or your primary care doctor and they do a pelvic exam, meaning they look with a speculum and they feel, it's important to know that they are not necessarily always doing a pap smear. Uh, sometimes we can get confused. We think that if we've had a pelvic exam, we assume that a pap smear has been done. And that's not always the case. So it's important to ask your doctor when you're having a pelvic exam, are you doing a pap smear? Is my pap smear up to date? Because the pap smear actually is a part of the pelvic exam, but we actually have to use a brush where we scrape some of the cells off of the cervix to collect them for testing. And if we don't do that, then you're not having a pap smear. So it's very important to understand the difference between a regular pelvic exam and a pap smear. The other thing is to note that if a woman goes into the emergency room and they have a pelvic exam, almost never are the doctors there going to do a pap smear because that's not the right setting to do that in. So um, it's important to understand the difference. Once a woman gets up to the age of 30 to 65, there are two strategies that we use for cervical cancer screening, okay? Um, the, we can either stick to the regular pap smear every three years, um, or we can add in addition to the pap smear an HPV test. And let's talk about the difference. So like I said before, the pap smear is when we actually scrape the cells of the cervix um, and send them for testing. So what that means is that we take the cells and we send them to a pathologist and the pathologist will look at them under the microscope the cells and they will tell us if those cells look abnormal, okay? That's a pap smear. When you add on the HPV test, in addition to the regular pap smear, we send a separate test for the human papillomavirus. Um, and that we add starting at the age of 30 to 65. Um, so, and if that's normal and you get regular screening, you need the pap smear and HPV test every five years. So 
With the addition of the HPV test, we're actually able to space out screening up to every three to five years. Um, the reason some may ask, well, why don't you test for HPV in women aged 21 to 29? Um, and the answer is that a lot of women between the ages of 20, 21 to 29 are going to be actively exposed to the human papillomavirus. And a lot of them will test positive and we, we don't want to unnecessarily intervene when their immune system will clear the virus on their own. So what we're trying to prevent is over treatment in that age group. Um, and so after the age of 30 to after the age of 30 up to the age of 65, we add that test because by that point, if we've been exposed our body, we would expect our immune system to have already cleared the virus. Um, some of the symptoms of cervical cancer and really almost of any of the gynecologic cancers are uh, vaginal bleeding. So any abnormal vaginal bleeding that you have should be evaluated. If you, if a woman goes into menopause and then all of a sudden a few years later they experience vaginal bleeding, even a small amount, that is not normal and needs to be evaluated. Uh, pelvic pain is another symptom. Pain after intercourse is another symptom. Unexplained weight loss or abdominal bloating or pain. So there are, those are all things that should prompt you to see your gynecologist or your primary care physician if those symptoms are present and they are persistent. 